nerds welcome back to another facebook live with an amazing author uh the author for today is mr pav singh all the way from the uk uh hi pav welcome to the session hi there yeah so for those of you who don't know about pav first of all let me introduce the book to you it's 1984 india's guilty secret and you know what uh what's Uh, whatever is happening right now in india uh, it's apt to you know uh, be discussing this book and uh, a little bit about the author uh, uh, pav lives in the uk he was born in leeds uh, do you live in leeds uh, right now also pav um no not anymore i um, okay. i live just outside london in in okay london. okay great uh, so um about his credentials uh, he has researched about this book he came to india he went and interviewed a bunch of people and has done app research and that shows up in the book because it is so kind of on point in the way it has been presented so congratulations on that pav uh, on writing this amazing book and it has refreshed a lot of you know those demons from 1984 it's uh, it was kind of i was totally affected by the book to be honest and i told you earlier also uh, so tell us a little bit about the kind of research that happened uh, when you were here, here in india yeah sure so um <clears throat> one second um yeah so i um i spent a year in india um back in 2000 2004 2005 um actually to um write a travel book on on india um and then I was swept away with the events of um that year the um second inquiry into the massacres of 1984 was released the manavati report um and then there was a lot of anger on the streets of delhi when that was released and no action was taken against the perpetrators um there was an a, a so called apology made by the then prime minister dr manmohan singh but there was no action taken um against his own um party party officials and mps so that's that's where um i i come in terms of my research yeah uh, but uh, you know when one is researching such about such books and such happenings there must be some you know anti sort of treatment you might have received when you were trying to you know research uh, about this book because you know nobody likes to bring out these things i mean uh, what it must have been around 20 odd years when you started researching about this book so what was happening at that point in time did you feel uh, uh, some anti sentiment or it was smooth sailing well it's quite mutual really i mean the the story is sort of hidden um particularly in the first decade since 1984 um very cleverly by by the government of the day um and even from day 1 they mischaracterized what took place the nature of the violence calling it riots um and as you know riots is is, is when two communities are fighting right. amongst each other um it's what, kind of a, it's kind of a neutral word uh, that is used because you know you can't go wrong with it actually no i would disagree i i i, okay. I think it was deliberately used to okay okay you with the perpetrators um yeah. to, to 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 say riot you were talking about okay. unorganized spontaneous reaction what took okay. place in november 84 after mrs gandhi was assassinated was not yeah. a spontaneous reaction uh my research research saw that for the first 24 hours after Mrs Gandhi was assassinated there was no killings it was actually one reported killing of a Sikh okay. um most a lot of Sikhs were roughed up but most people thought you know that, that was it it was actually the next day after leaders of at at got together and started to um put in place the plan that you know they'd already um planned months in advance so this is something that didn't just happen it was made to happen Um, right so so i think it's very important that we use the correct language okay. because because we haven't for the last 36 years the yeah. perpetrators have gone yeah. um evaded justice 
and we haven't actually tackled the nature of, of the violence, the massacres and the mass rape. Right. Uh, so, I mean, organized pogroms are such a blot on humanity, actually. Uh, why are they repeated so often? I mean, it has been happening throughout history. I mean, how does it happen? Because uh, before anything bad happens like that, we always think that we are in control, you know, as a community, as society, as a democracy. Uh, but still, you know, it gets repeated. Yeah, and it's it's a very sad story for um, independent India that these events keep occurring. I think the main thing is that we don't learn the lessons and yeah. we give impunity to those who perpetrate and also the law law enforcement, the police, who, who were involved in 84 and have been involved in pogroms since 1984, 1994, yeah. 2002. So there are powerful people who let this happen, make this happen, and then right. they're immune from prosecution. And then yeah. it's judicial cover-up, and that's happened yeah. in the case of 1984 yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of issues that need to be tackled in terms of what kind of India are we living in? You know, is yeah. it the India that was promised in 1947, a secular uh, republic? Or is, is it an India that's now majority rule, uh, more right. of a, a Hindu state, yeah. Hindu our state. So yeah. it's a very important um, debate that needs to be had, particularly with a new generation of Indians who may not know about the events of November right. 1984. Right. Um, you have mentioned in the book, and this came as a surprise because, pardon me, I have not read that much literature on this topic. And everything was, a lot of these things were, you can say that, they were kept from us because we didn't ever read them in history books, right? This is not at all, I mean, this is not at all mentioned in uh, our history books in school. So, I mean, a lot of my generation are not aware about what happened, actually, you know? So, uh, you have said that this was supposed to happen anyways. Absolutely, yeah. that's, that's the big um, surprise, really. Um, you know, they, they, there's now witness testimony saying that um, this was going to take place and actually it was going to take a place on um, Guru Nanak Dev Ji's Gurupur and yeah. um, yeah. the birthday of the first Sikh Guru which lands on the 8th of November. 8th, right. Um, yeah. So it would have taken place anyway whether Mrs Gandhi was assassinated or not. So we've wow. got witness tes testimony now and we also have a very good strong testimony from a former petroleum secretary who's named um, one of the members of the Gandhi family as okay. the mastermind um, who um, made sure that the list of Sikh homes and businesses to be targeted um, yeah. were, you know, re retrieved from the Gurdwari uh, five months before no November 1984. Um, yeah. And he gave the order, um, the strategy to get hold of Sikh youth, to put a, um, a tire filled with kerosene and yeah. burn Sikhs alive to, in his um, quote, um, to calm the anger of the Hindus. So it was a very meticulous, very politically motivated right. pogrom that took yeah. place. Goodness gracious, I, I uh, read the term necklacing and I, I had to leave the book for a moment because you know, it is, it was so visual. Uh, I don't know if I should, uh, regard, regarding this topic, I don't know, I would have said it's a very visual depiction that you have done but I don't know if it was working for me while reading the book. Um, yeah, it was tough, I mean, to, uh, to say the least. Uh, but I think that would be a compliment to you because you have not minced any words and you have portrayed uh, whatever happened as it is. Uh, uh, so tell us, share a little bit of uh, those, uh, the part where you were researching. Did you do interviews and stuff? Uh, what? How did you feel when you were actually interviewing these people? Because, of course, writing comes later. But when you're interacting with these people, it must have been tough. Um, it, it was. But, um, I mean, I when I was in India in 2004, I mean, my um, maternal um, aunt, uh, my Masi and my Masa live in Delhi. And they, with, their, with the four cousins, um, and they luckily survived the, the, okay. the genocide. Um, they were taken in by their Hindu neighbours and, and then um, eventually ended up in a refugee camp. 
but it was my master who took me into um, a place called Dilek Nagar and Dilek Vihar in 2004, where yeah. I met the, the victims and the survivors. Okay. Um, and it really dawned on me how hidden this story was. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a national shame for India to have a widow's colony in central oh, Delhi that no one knows about. There is yeah. widows and orphans there who were given um, housing after pogroms, um, yeah. dilapidated um, housing, pittance compensation. Um, and yeah. they're, they are there, they're kept there. that's the hidden um story and narratives that we need we need to bring out yeah. really yeah um it i mean i was not aware about this uh thanks to you i came to know about this there is a colony like that and it exists i mean it is just just you know uh pretty sad uh, what is your opinion on banned books um a lot a lot of governments have tried to do that and do you think uh your book would have released in india if there was you know, Congress in power or, you know, people who were responsible in power? Yeah, I don't think it, I, I don't think it, it, it would have been um, released. Um, it probably okay. would have been banned in the Congress. Um, there was okay. a number of books were banned in the Congress. In fact, the first report on, on the genocide, um, just a few weeks after it taking place, um, the Who Are the Guilty report yeah. uh, by two human rights groups, that, that was banned in Punjab. Um, okay. And the publisher, um, no, no, no other than Jagmohan Singh, who's the nephew okay. of uh, Shahid Bhagat Singh. Okay. Um, he, he was, um, you know, um, hauled up to trial um, and accused for waging a war against the state. And yeah. he simply just released a report about what took yeah. place. So there's yeah. a number of things that took place, a lot of censorship um sort of around the 2000s there was a, a, a famous film i don't know if you know a film called amu um yeah. by, by, i did hear about it when it came out i did hear about it although it didn't gain so much of traction but yeah. i know it's it's mentioned in the book so i again you know uh, kind of remembered that this came out yeah so that book that um film was um almost banned and then the Indian okay. censorship um, forced um, the, the director, Shonali Bose, to delete some lines um, yeah. from, from where, where some widows are actually pinpointing what took place and who was responsible, the politicians, okay. um, you know, the neta, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it was given an A, an A certificate so that it couldn't be shown on Indian TV. Um, I think you can probably watch it on Amazon or Netflix. So I, I definitely yeah. recommend that people do do watch the film Ammu. Before they get regulated as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's about to happen perhaps next year. Uh, so uh, I uh, was deeply affected by uh, the rapes that happened. And I believe, you, and you have also mentioned in the book uh, that uh, nobody has been prosecuted. For those and the numbers are staggering because i believe there were no fir's also right no absolutely not i mean the the survivors were um often um being chased by politicians and police um you know lots of inti intimidation took place after 1984 um for for, for, for this to happen. Yes, it's a shame that not one prosecution has happened in the case of rape, but we were talking yeah. talk about mass rape that took place. Yeah. And this was instigated by leaders, local leaders um, at the time, not just after the killings of, of Sikh men and boys, but then the, the women who were left behind were gang raped, were taken to outlying um, villages, kidnapped, and never seen even again. Many many women and, and young girls were killed as well. So this is very much a hidden story of 1980. Right. Many do not know that actually right. women and um, girls were, were you know sexually um, abused and yeah. killed. Um, young boys were killed as well as their their fathers and uncles. If we'd known that at the time, it was pretty obvious to everyone that this was a calculated genocide, um, right. or in my words, a genocidal massacre, which is a small small scale, scale genocide and okay. i think the world would have actually looked at india and asked the question how did did this happen on your watch um please shed more light on the intergenerational you know effects of this because uh, that is kind of we don't think about it 
I mean, it's 2020, but uh, I mean, people who get affected by this, their generations are affected. So uh, what did, what came out of your research that what are the effects so I, I look at, um, after 84, many tens of thousands of Sikhs had to escape to refugee camps. Many of them um, were, you know, uh, not organized by the government. The government didn't help them at all. So these were unofficial camps um, run by local citizens of all faiths and the Gurdwari, and they were serving yeah. Manga and so forth. Yeah. But in those um, camps, these stories started coming out. Many women just couldn't take it and committed suicide. Yeah. Um, you know, um, they're kind of orphans who were left behind, to, who, who witnessed terrible crimes, um, ended up taking drugs for years on ends, yeah. um, real trauma, mental health, and that's now become intergenerational. Um, and it's something that India really needs to look at, this community. They really need yeah. to um, help that community in terms of um, providing counselling, providing meaningful jobs, um, employment, right. not menial right. jobs that they've been given, and, and proper housing. So I think this right. is a call to India um, and the government to actually um, start helping these communities because they've been left behind. True, true. Uh, before we go into other questions, uh, I go to page 187 of your book and you have suggested some uh, the scope of any commission uh that and you have included several points i would like to read a couple and then we can perhaps discuss them uh you have said that the precise nature of the conspiracy to murder six uh and mass uh when were plans first mooted uh hashed and subsequently brought forward who was involved when and why and secondly you have mentioned the possible role played by rajiv gandhi senior congress leaders uh, such as Arun Nehru, the police, the military, and any other state bodies in the planning, execution, and subsequent uh, cover-up of the genocidal ma massacres. It's staggering that all these, uh, uh, this military, the police, everybody had colluded. I mean, I know you have mentioned some people who tried hard to, you know, fight back on a very individual sort of moral basis, but it's quite staggering. Uh, so this, the commission scope you're mentioning, uh, do you feel that uh, this can happen? Probably not under, yeah. under the current administration. Um, I think okay. we need to look at the future um, okay. and I'm hoping that a future administration and a future um, you know, generation will look at this yeah. and actually call for, what I'm calling for is completely different from what we've had before. We've had nine inquiries okay. and commissions. This is not what I'm calling for. I'm calling for a, yeah. an independence, truth and reconciliation commission. So this has okay. happened in other countries like South Africa, in Central, Central America and also in Bosnia, um, where this is really for the victims. It needs to be okay. um, directed by the, by the victims and their representatives, um, not by the state. Um, okay. it needs to be completely independent. And I think it needs to have uh, allow space for those people in the administration, in the civil service, who know the truth, who know how you know the phosphorus um, chemicals, you know how was how was that ordered? I mean, it's not something that yeah. you can find. And this this chemical was used to, you know, um, kill Sikhs, um, burn yeah. Sikhs to the to to the bone. You know who who arranged for fifty or sixty unauthorized um, trains to be stopped so that mobs can yeah. go on and hunt Sikhs. Who you know made sure that the hospitals were closed, the burns yeah. um, you know the, the, the burns um, departments were closed at a time when most of the cases were burn burns victims. Yeah. You know who ordered the kerosene? Who ordered the the weapons? Who yeah. ordered the, the the mobs to go into Sikh neighborhoods and start the killings? Attacking yeah. Gurdwari, burning those down. Uh, there's a list. The list is, in, you know, is endless. This I is know, a, this know. is just starting. That there's so yeah. much in this that needs to come out. Right. I think this needs a lot of will more than anything else. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's going to happen right now, but perhaps in the future. Um, what was the one thing that you were cautious about while writing this book? Because it's such a subject when you take it up. It's such a huge responsibility in some ways. So what were those things that you were kind of uh, wary about? 
Well, I wanted to avoid hyperbole. I didn't want to exaggerate anything. Okay. Um, so the way I, I did this is to base everything on evidence on witness testimony. So much okay. of the testimony I've, I've based it on is from um, the first commission, the Missouri Commission. Yeah. A yeah. lot of the testimonies weren't released at the time. So I got hold of those. And so, so I really wanted to give a voice to those testimonies. It was so important I got this right. I also got this peer reviewed by the pe very people who was involved in the relief camps. Um, so the likes of Dr. Uma Chakravarti, um, the lawyer um, Fulka and people like that on, on the ground in India that I know, um, checked the book. Um, I had a QC in this country, um, Jeffrey Robertson, one of our leading human rights barrister who read the book and he gave me actually the name, the title of the book, um, India's okay. uh, Guilty Secret. Okay. Um, so it's very important that I got this right. It um, actually hits hard. The title hits hard. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I, I think that was a good title given by him. Um, also, um, Punjab and center have always have some trouble. You know, I read this book by uh, uh, Kushwant Singh, the autobiography of Captain Amrinder Singh earlier this year. And uh, it has also got it, it kind of overlaps also with your book in some ways because it's telling uh, another viewpoint. Uh, so I got kind of two cameras on the same, you know, happenings. Um, and uh, so why does this happen with agriculture, with water, water and, you know, so many terrorism, in fact, in 1984, as it was termed. So why does this happen always with Punjab? Why this tussle? I think it's it stems from 1947 and even before that, where um, Sikhs who made a large part of the independent movement. Um, we all know Shaheed Bhagat Singh, Udham Singh, lots of other, and, and, and many, many Sikhs, yeah. you know, making only 2% of the population, 80% was part of the movement, 80% right. were, you know, convicted, um, hanged. So a massive, um, you know, um, involvement in the independence. And they were promised by Nehru and also by uh, Mahatma Gandhi that they would yeah. be given freedom, they'd be given a state within India right. where, quote, a, a glow of freedom they'd be able to enjoy. Um, and then that was all reneged um, after independence. So, so there's always been a saw there that um, Punjab wasn't given that freedom. Um, and there, you know, then we had the issue of river waters and electricity, and they don't even have their own capital city. We have to share it with Haryana, Chandigarh. Right. Yeah. Um, there's many things, um, you know, Sikhs in the constitution as, are labeled as Hindus, um, not an independent um, religion. So yeah. there are lots of other things that... Um, that That is kind of strange. And I was not really aware about that. <laughs> that is very strange. Yeah. Yeah. So they're banded with um, Jains and Parsis as, as yeah, part of the right. religion yeah. in, in the constitution. So, yeah. and, and you know, that when, when the constitution was written, I think in 1950, the Sikh representatives yeah. were moved out. They couldn't sign up to it yeah. at all. So I think that's the genesis of what took place. And then the Congress party decided, well, let's, let's make this a political issue. Let's label Sikhs as the other. Um, and then they have this dubious role of supporting terrorist organizations themselves on both sides. Um, I think they created a situation where the whole country would say, actually, Sikhs are, um, you know, a threat to the nation, the yes. unity of the nation, and they othered Sikhs. And that's right. what took place in 1984 with the attack on the Golden Temple, and then the yeah. pogroms that took place in November. Yeah. Uh, I would like to show the viewers uh, this photograph uh, from the book. It's on page 71, and it shows, I don't know if you guys can see it, it shows uh, Indira Gandhi with, with Margaret Thatcher. And uh, later on, uh, of course, uh, much later, it was uh, uh, documents came out in public and it was said that uh, even UK had a role in, you know, uh, uh, especially in Operation Blue Star. So uh, could you shed more light on that? What happened in the UK as a repercussion and how did this happen? I mean, it's kind of strange you know, another country interfering. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there was always rumors that the British were involved in Operation Blue Star, but it was only a few years ago that there were papers that were released um, from the National Archive in, in London um, to show that actually the, the government 
although on an advisory basis, um, were involved in Operation, Operation Blue Star. Um, and the, there was even a, a, a report by um, the SAS, which we haven't got hold of yet because they're, they're still not releasing it. Um, many papers have not been released by, by Britain um, to show how close they were involved in, in Operation Blue Star and um, the attack on um, Hanmunda Seb, which, which we, and also the attack on 40 other Gurdwade in, in right. June, many people don't know. Um, yeah. So to, to, to get hold of at least maybe a hundred people in the Golden Temple, they ended up massacring thousands of people, many, many pilgrims on the busiest um, day of the Sikh, um, Sikh calendar. So um, it was something that should have been avoided at all costs, um, but not sending battalions and tanks into, right. into the Golden Temple. It was going to end in disaster. Right. Uh, tell us a bit about the experience with uh, publishing this book, uh, how how long did you take to actually write the book, uh, put it down? Of course, you came to India and researched, but after that, uh, how was the process? Yes, the process was um, so really started in two thousand five, collecting evidence. But I I never thought I'd be writing a book, um, and it was only when I was working for a publisher, a publisher uh, Bloomsbury. Right. Um, that an, another author said to me, Pav, you know, you've done various talks, you've done exhibitions in London, yeah. um, you've got a lot of evidence and testimony you're sitting on, you should really write the story of 1984. And it was only then that I started to take this seriously. It was about a two month, two year process of actually writing okay. um, the book um, and then finding a publisher. And I was lucky to find a really good publisher in the UK, right. Kashmir House. And also yeah. in India, uh, Rupa Publications, who've been very, very supportive of, right. of my work. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, let's digress from the book uh, a little bit. Uh, since it's book nerds and we always love to recommend and read, of course, good books. Uh, do you get time to read? How is your life like? I mean, do you really get time to read? What do you read? We would love to know. Yeah, I have lots of time, obviously, now we're, we're, we've just come out of a lockdown, but yeah. during lockdown, I've managed to, to, to read lots of books. I read all sorts, um, as, as you can see on my book. Yes, bookcase. that's uh, an impressive shelf. That's an impressive shelf. I love it. <laughs> I, I read lots of India, um, books in India, but I'm also wider. I mean, one of my favorite authors is George Orwell. Um, okay. So it's ironic that I, I was the one who wrote the real 1984 as opposed to his. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And in fact, uh, uh, those who are watching this session, uh, they should, you know, read the book, this one, uh, and you, you know, you'll find some references. So uh, I'll just say that, not many spoilers, because those parts, I really love those parts when you are making references to uh, the original 1984. Uh, let's talk about lockdown reading. Uh, how did it go for you and what all did you read? Um, so I've been reading um, lots of old books, you know, um, Jane Austen, I've been revisiting as well. Um, you know, I, I read uh, JK Rowling, latest books as well. So yeah. I've always been a fan of the, the, the Potter series anyway, but uh, her latest books I've been, I've been reading as well. Um, and I've been reading lots of nonfiction books, particularly about what's taking place in this country um, around various debates around, um, you know, race issues and Black Lives Matters and, and, right. and issues like that. So it's very varied, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good time to read, good time to recommend other, yeah. other authors. And uh, it's great to have this platform that you've right. given me as well. We are lucky to have you. And uh, I feel that you are more, more you know, inclined towards nonfiction and you have done it well, of course, in this book. Do you plan to shift or you want to continue with this thing you have for nonfiction? Yeah, I'd probably like to stay in nonfiction. I think that okay. resonates with me. Yeah. So I think I, I kind of base it on my own life experience growing up, you know, as a, you know, a son of a Punjabi um, yeah. you know, immigrant family in this country. So it's all what you know and what your experience is that makes books, I think. Right. Great having you, Pav. Uh, it was lovely uh, reading the book because some things, as I told you, I mean, we have missed out. I mean, I was born in 1984, 7th June, but you know, our, our history books don't depict 
a lot of it. So it was great. It was kind of educational, I must say. And I would recommend this book to everyone. Uh, go check it out because, you know, you'll get to know a lot about what happened and we have to learn for the future also. So I would request the politicians also to learn from it, uh, certainly, and other uh, stakeholders. Thank you so much for uh, doing this, uh, sparing time for us. And uh, we look forward to having you perhaps in India, hosting you at a book club meetup or something. Uh, so yeah, yeah, looking forward to that. Thank That's you so great. much. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.